Chapter Seven of *The Dust Flower* by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Seven. And all this while, Letty was in the dining room, learning certain lessons from her new-found friend. For some little time, she had been alone. Steptoe finalized his conversation with Miss Walbrook on the telephone, but did not come back. She sat at the table feeding Beppo with bread and milk, but wondering if, after all, she hadn't better make a bolt for it. She'd had her breakfast, which was an asset to the good, and nothing worse could happen to her out in the open world than she feared in this great, dim, gloomy house. She had once crept in to look at the cathedral, and, overwhelmed by its height, immensity, and mystery, had crept out again. Its emotional suggestions had been more than she could bear. She felt now as if her bed had been made and her food laid out in that cathedral, as if, as long as she remained, she must eat and sleep in this vast, pillared solemnity. And that was only one thing. There were small practical considerations even more terrible to confront. If Nettie were to appear again... But it was as to this that Steptoe was making his appeal. "'I say, girls, don't you go to making a fuss and spoiling your lives when you've got a chance it'll never come again?' Mrs. Courage answered for them all. To sacrifice decency to self-interest wasn't in them, nor never would be. Some there might be, like Henry Steptoe, who would sell their birthright for a mess of pottage, but Mary Ann Courage was not of that company, nor any other woman upon whom she could use her influence. If a hussy had been put to reign over them, Reigned over by Hussey, none of them would be. All they asked was to see her once, to deliver the ultimatum of giving notice. "'It's a strange thing to me,' stepped her reason, "'that when one poor person gets a lift, every other poor person comes down on them. "'I might be asked who you mean by poor persons?' "'Who should I mean, Mrs. Courage, but people like us? "'If we don't hang on by each other, who'll hang by us, I should like to know?' "'Here's one of us, Blyce, in a high position, and "'instead of being proud of it and giving her a lift to carry her along, "'you're all for making it as hard for her as you can. "'Do you call that sensible?' "'I call it sensible for everyone to stay in their proper spear. "'So that if a man's poor, you must keep him poor, "'no matter how he tries to better himself? "'That's what your proper spears would come to.' "'But argument being of no use, "'Steptoe could only make up his mind to revolution in the house.' "'The poor's very good to the poor when one of them's in trouble,' was his summing up. "'But let one of them have an extra stroke of luck, "'and all the rest will jaw against him like so many magpies.' "'As a parting shot, he declared on leaving the kitchen, "'The trouble with you girls is you ain't got no class spunk, "'and that's why, in spirit, you'll never be nothing but menials.' "'This lack of esprit de corps was something he couldn't understand.' But what he understood less was the need of the heart to touch occasionally the high points of experience. Mrs. Courage and Jane, to say nothing of Nettie, after thirty years of domestic routine, had reached the place where something in the way of drama had become imperative. The range and the pantry produce inhibitions as surely as the desk or the drawing-room. On both natures inhibitions had been packed like feathers on a seabird, till the soul cried out to be released from some of them. It might mean going out from the home that had sheltered them for years, and breaking with all their traditions, but now that the chance was there, neither could refuse it. To a virtuous woman, starched and stiffened in her virtue, steeped in it, dyed in it, permeated by it through and through, nothing so stirs the dramatic, so quickens the imagination, so calls the spirit to the purple emotional heights, as contact with the sister she knows to be a hussy. For Jane Cakebread and Mary Ann Courage, the opportunity was unique. "'Then I'll go. I'll go straight now.' As Steptoe brought the information that the three women of the household were coming to announce the resignation of their posts, Letty sprang to her feet. "'May I ask Madam to sit down again and let me explain?' Taking this as an order, she sank back into her chair again. He stood confronting her as before, one hand resting lightly on the table. "'Nothing so good won't have happened in this house since old Mrs. Adderton went to work and died,' 
that his eyes shone with their tiny fires, not in pleasure, but in wonder. "'When old servants is good, they're good. But even when they're good, there's times when you can't help wishing as how the Lord would be pleased to tuck them to himself.' He allowed this to sink in before going further. "'The men's all right, for the most part. Indoor work comes natural to him, and they'll swing it without no complaints. But with the women it's kick, 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 and when they warn themselves out with kicking, they begin to kick again. What ply for a man, for them ain't nothing but slivery. Letty listened as one receiving revelations from another world. I ain't what they call a woman hater. I believe as God made woman for a purpose. And I can't bring myself to think as the human race has rightly found out yet what that purpose is. God's wise is always dark, and when it comes to women, they're darker, nor they are elsewheres. One thing I do know, and we'll be a lot more comfortable when more of us finds it out, that God never made woman for the home. In spite of her awe of him, Letty found this doctrine difficult to accept. If God didn't make him for the home, mister, where on earth would you put him? The wintry colour came out again on the old man's cheeks. If madam would call me Steptoe, he said ceremoniously, I think she'd find it easier. I mean, he went on, reverting to the original theme, that he didn't make em to be cooks and housemaids and parlourmaids and all that. That's men's work. Men'll do as easy as a bird'll sing. I never see the woman yet as didn't fret herself over it, like a wired animal or fret itself in a circus cage. It spiles women to put em to housework, like it always spiles people to put em to jobs for which the law didn't give em no haptitude. Nettie was puzzled, but followed partially. "'I've watched them and watched them. It's always the same tile. They'll go into service young and joyous-like, but it won't be two or three years before they'll have grown cat nasty, like this here giant kite-bread and Mary Ann Gurridge. Madam would never believe what sweet young things they was when I first picked them out. Mrs. Courage, a young widow, and Jiny as nice a girl as Madam would wish to see and with the features which Mrs. Allerton used to call a little hover-accentuated. And now! He allowed the conditions to speak for themselves without criticising further. It's keeping them at home what's done it. They knows it themselves, and yet they don't. Inside they've got the spirits of young colts that want to kick up their heels in the pasture. They don't mean no worse nor that. Only when people comes to Jiny's age and Mrs. Courage's, They'll have to kick up their heels in their own way. If madam will remember that, and be patient with them, like— Then he cried in alarm. But it's got nothing to do with me. If madam will excuse me, it's got everything to do with her. She's the missus of this house. Oh, no, I ain't. Mr. Addison just brung me here. Once more there was the delicate emphasis with which he had corrected other slips. Uh, Mr. Addison brought madam— and told me to see that she was put in her proper place. If madam will let me steer the thing, I'll make it as easy for her as easy. He reflected as to how to make the situation clear to her. I've been reading about the time when our light Queen Victoria had come to the throne as quite a young girl. She didn't know nothing about politics or presiding at councils or nothing. But she'd had a prime minister, kind of a upper servant, you might say, her servant was what he always called himself. Whatever he told her to do, she'd done. Walked through it all, you might sigh, till she got the hang of it. But once she did get the hang of it, well, there wasn't no big bug in the world that our most gracious sovereign lady couldn't put it all over on. Once more he allowed her time to assimilate this parable. Now, if Madame would only think of herself as called in youth to reign over this house. Oh, but I couldn't! And yet it's madam's duty, now that she's married to its head. Yes, but he didn't marry me like that. He married me all queer-like. This was the way. She poured out the story, while Steptoe listened quietly. There being no elements in it of the kind he called shidy, he found it romantic. No one had ever suspected the longings for romance which had filled his heart and imagination when he was a poor little scullion boy. But the memory of them, with some of the reality, was still fresh in his hidden inner self. 
Now it seemed as if remotely and vicariously romance might be coming to him after all, through the boy he adored. On her tale, his only comment was to say, "'I've been reading. I'm a great reader,' he threw in parenthetically. "'Wonderful exercise for the mind, and learns you things which you wouldn't be likely to hear tell of. But I've been reading about a king. I'll show you his name in the book. Who oh, fell in love with a beggar maid. Oh, but Mr. Allison didn't fall in love with me. That remains to be seen. She lifted her hands in awed amazement. Mr. I mean, Steptoe, you, you don't think. The subway dream of love at first sight was as tenacious in her soul as the craving for romance in his. He nodded. I've known stranger things to happen. But, but he couldn't. It was beyond her power of expression, though Steptoe knew what she meant. Not him. He answered judicially. He may come to it. It'll be a tough job to bring him. But if Madame will be guided by me. Letty collapsed. Her spirit grew faint, as the spirit of Christian when he described far off the walls of the celestial city, with the dark river rolling between him and it. Letty knew the dark river must be there, but if beyond it there lay the slightest chance of the celestial city. She came back to herself, as it were, on hearing Steptoe say that the procession from the kitchen would presently begin to form itself. Now, if Madame will be guided by me, she'll meet this situation vice to vice. Oh, but I'd never know what to say. Madame won't need to say nothing. She won't have to speak. Here they'll troop in. A jester described Mrs. Courage leading the advance through the doorway. And here they'll stand. Madame will sit just where she's sitting, a little further back from the table, looking over the morning piper like. He placed the paper in her hand. And as each gives notice, Madame will just bow her head. See? Madame saw, but not exactly. Now, if she had just move her chair... The chair was moved in such a way as to make it seem that the occupant, having finished her breakfast, was giving herself a little more space. And if Madame would remove her hat and jacket, she'd, she'd seem more like the lady of the house at home. Letty took off these articles of apparel which stepped her whisked out of sight. Now, I'll be Mrs. Courage coming to say, madam, I wish to give notice. Madam will lie the piper just enough to show her inclining of her head, assenting to Mrs. Courage leaving her. Mrs. Courage will be all for having words. She's a great hand for words, Mrs. Courage is. But if madam won't say nothing at all, the wind will be out of Mrs. Courage's soils like. Now, will madam be so good? Having passed out into the hall, he entered with Mrs. Courage's majestic gait, pausing some three feet from the table to say, "'Madam, things being as they are, and me not wishing to stay no longer in the house where I've served so many years, I beg to give notice that I'm a-giving of notice and mean to quit right off.' Letty lowered the paper from before her eyes, jerking her head briskly. "'Yes,' stepped out, commended, brief doubtfully, "'a little too—well, too abrupt, well, too as you might say. Most ladies, real eye ladies, like the light Mrs. Allerton, inclines their head slow and graceful like first they throws it back a bit so as to get a purchase on it and then they bring it forward calm like lowering it stightly perhaps if madam would be me for a bit that could be mrs courage and let me sit there and be her i, I could show her the places were reversed it was letty who came in as mrs courage while steptoe seated in the chair lowered the paper to the degree which he thought dignified Letty mumbled something like the words the hypothetical Mrs. Courage was presumed to use, while Steptoe slowly threw back his head for the purchase, bringing it forward in condescending grace. Language could not have given Mrs. Courage so effective a retort courteous. Letty was enchanted. "'Oh, Steptoe, let me have another try. I believe I could swing the cat.' Again the places were reversed. Steptoe, having repeated the role of Mrs. Courage, Letty imitated him as best she could in getting the purchase of her bow and catching his air of high-bred condescension. Better, he approved. If Madame wouldn't lower her head quite so far backward, you see, Madame, a lady doesn't know she's throwing her back her head so as to get a grip on it. She does it unconscious like, because being of an haughty spirit, she holds it high natural. 
If Madame will only stiffer her neck like as if spirit had made her about two inches taller than she is. Having seized this idea, Letty tried again, with such success that Mrs. Courage was disposed of. Jane Cakebread followed next, with Nettie last of all. Unaware of his possession of histrionic ability, Steptoe gave to each character its outstanding traits, fluttering like Jane and giggling like Nettie, not in zeal for a newly discovered interpretive art, but in order that Letty might be nowhere caught at a disadvantage. He was delighted with her quickness in imitation. "'Couldn't have done that better myself,' he declared, after Nanetti had been dismissed for the third or fourth time. "'When it comes to the inclining of the head, I should sigh as Madame was about let to perfect, as they say on the stage. If Mr. Rash was to see it, he'd swear as his mad must come back again.' with some whispering, and once or twice Nettie's stifled cackle of a laugh. "'Here they are,' he warned her. "'Madam must be firm and control herself. There's nothing for her to be afraid of. Just let her think of the light Queen Victoria, called to the throne when younger even than Madam is.' A shuffling developed into one lone step, heavy, stately, and funereal. Doing her best to emulate the historic example held up to her, Letty lengthened her neck and stiffened it. A haughty spirit seemed to rise in her by the mere process of the elongation. She was so nervous that the paper shook in her hand, but she knew that if the celestial city was to be won, she could shrink from no tests which might lead her on to victory. Steptoe had relapsed into the Major Domo's office, announcing from the doorway, "'Mrs. Courage to see Madam, if Madam would be pleased to receive her.' Madame indicated that she was so pleased, scrambling after the standard of the maiden sovereign of Windsor Castle, giving audience to princes and ambassadors. End of chapter 7